Hey guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetrabit Gaming, the series where we explore video game content that goes unused, altered, or normally unseen. In this case, we'll be taking a look at some unreleased tech demos for one of my favorite consoles, the Nintendo 64. For those who haven't heard yet, the pipes over at Nintendo have been leaking like crazy lately, and from it several things have been released to us such as pre-release Pokemon info, source codes, and SDK or software development kit data. Amongst these was also several Nintendo 64 tech demos, many of which are from the company Silicon Graphics or SGI. Now without getting into too much detail, basically SGI's Nintendo Operations Department developed the Reality Coprocessor which handled the Nintendo 64's graphics and audio. And as such, many of these tech demos were demos to test that tech, go figure. Now as I understand, not all of these tech demos are from this recent leak and some have been around for longer, but I wanted to make this video as definitive as I can so I'll be covering all the ones that I could currently find and or run. Also if you're interested in a more laid back, almost let's play style of me going through these, I'll leave a link to the highlights video from Tetrabit Plus linked at the top of the description below. Anyways guys, enough talk, let's hop into some Nintendo 64 tech demo lost bits. Alright, so going in alphabetical order, starting things off on a very high note, we have Block Monkey. Now I'm seeing plenty of blocks, but no monkeys. Bummer. In this demo, the player can scale the size of the blocks, duplicate or remove blocks, as well as split the blocks into smaller blocks. That's a lot of blocks in one sentence. Apparently splitting up the blocks into too many little blocks was not a good idea as it completely crashed the demo. Here you can also move the background open box thing closer and further away, change its layering, and also divide up the bottom face into smaller little rectangles. And if that wasn't enough, you can also press the Z button to toggle the mode to do a host of additional things like change the lighting, move the camera in and around the blocks, slap a texture of Mario on them, change that texture to bricks, and more. This demo is used to test performance as well as apparently measure the time needed to render a polygon. Oddly, there's also another file that appears to be identical to this one called Thread Monkey, with no differences that I could note. Either way, I gotta say, this is one aesthetic looking tech demo. Next is Bump Map, and just as the name implies, this basically tests bump mapping, which is essentially simulating textures like bumps or wrinkles on a 3D object without actually changing its shape. In this demo here, this is done with a polygonal sphere made to look like a moon. I wasn't able to interact with the moon at all in this demo, so not much more to say about this one. Now on to CCBL, and this is again a tech demo showing off the rendering capabilities of the N64. Here the user can zoom in and out from the cube, change its color and lighting and more. You can also change the object to a strange looking sphere, an X, Y, Y, Z pair of planes, some mountains, a triangle, the letter A, an interlocked pair of toruses, tori, not sure what the plural form is, a model called Mizo, as well as my favorite, a tetra, a basic tetrahedron. Texturing it didn't seem to work for me, but you can also change the background color or even change it to an image. We got some very crude programmer art of what looks like a volcano or mountain with a plane flying over it. Gonna need a translation check guys, I assume this is Japanese, if anyone knows what this says please do let me know down in the comments. Then there's also this image, which I honestly have no idea what it is. Name one thing in this image, I dare you. And lastly here, you can also render in a second model, either another plane or a set of red stars. Not sure why, but you can. Overall, a pretty slick little model test demo. Next we got CI8FB, what a name, and it starts off just as an empty turquoise-ish screen. At first I thought that was it, until all of a sudden it changed into a different shade. Apparently this program is supposed to change the number and size of all the triangles displayed on screen at the same time. I'm not sure if I got this to work as intended, but this is what I got. Then we have Detail, which features only half the screen for some reason, so let's just focus up on that. Here the player starts situated over a fast moving river between two solid chunks of land. You can control the camera with flight controls here, but yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it's really hard to control. I guess the purpose of this particular demo, based on the name, now get this, big brain time, was to show the details of the textures and terrain formations from afar and up close. 
Now these certainly don't look very impressive by today's standards, but keep in mind, in the mid 90s when this was being developed, this was pretty cutting edge for consoles. Eep Test, just how it sounds, is a simple double EEPROM test program. It automatically tests a long 4K read and write capability, and yeah, that's about it. Phil is next. Let's give it up for Phil. Yep, this is a thing. A red screen quickly gets filled up with yellow triangles and a range of shades. This is another basic demo just used to simply measure the performance of painting out the screen with polygons. Riveting, I know. Next up is Flash, and this apparently tested for a 1M Flash ROM. Now I'm not exactly sure what that is, but all I gathered from this one was being able to write what I assume are random hexadecimal memory addresses, clear them, and sometimes make them appear red. My knowledge in this space is pretty limited, so maybe one of you guys can shed some more light on this down in the comments. Now onto one of my favorite tech demos out of the bunch, Fog Test. This demo, of course, tests fog, and it certainly bears a basic, yet striking resemblance to a certain game dealing with a certain fox that flies through space. Anyways, here the user can play around with the fog parameters, such as how close or far away it is, and its color. I was also able to edit the culling settings to make the terrain extend even further back. And I ended up with a really aesthetic landscape, if I do say so myself. Oh yeah, you can also control the camera here, kind of like in the detail tech demo from before, only here you don't fly off the stage as it just loops, so it's not as bad. Honestly, flying through this terrain was so relaxing. I feel like I could just slap on some synthwave or vaporwave music and just vibe to this for a very long time. Next we got GBP Test, and this is a basic function checker for the Nintendo 64 transfer pack accessory. Here you can test the connection, the reading and writing capability, and more. Unfortunately, since this isn't running on real hardware, no transfer pack could be detected, so not much I could really do here. Ground is next, and here the player can toy around with a textured plane beneath a bouncing ball. Now I don't know about you guys, but the first brick wall texture here really reminds me of that one old Windows 95 maze screensaver. Very nostalgic. Anyways, here you can scale the texture to make it appear bigger or smaller, swap to a texture featuring a green, yellow, blue, and red sphere, and you can even scale the actual dimensions of the floor plane to stretch it as wide or as thin as your heart desires. Ha, <laughs> look at this long boy. Well, ground, consider yourself tested. High Rezo greets us with a cool, chonky Pikachu with some shades half on and holding a plastic bag because reasons. This appears to be in some Japanese office and I have no clue why these drawings are on this image. Here all you can really do is swap between a low and high resolution version of the image. There's also a hardware usage meter on the bottom so this was clearly used to test how usage differs between the different resolutions. Letters is up next, but there's only one letter here and two numbers. I feel lied to. But yeah, all we got here is a model of U64 spinning and rotating over a texture of what looks to be a football stadium. For those that don't know, before going with the shortened name Nintendo 64, the console's initial working title was Nintendo Ultra 64, and the U64 here is certainly a reference to that. All in all though, this is definitely just a demo showing off the types of objects the Nintendo 64 was capable of rendering. In a similar fashion, next is lines, and here we get to see a rotating sphere made up of several lines, also known as a wireframe. It appears in a gradient of colors made up of red, green, and blue, much like the gradient rectangle of the colors behind it. Next up is Mip Map, and here we are greeted with four different displays of a texture cube as well as a backdrop. In each case, we can see a method of texture processing, point sampled, bilinear, and RGB2C and hand gen MIP map. At first, I assumed the MIP had something to do with the MIPS R4200 processor, the one the Nintendo 64's processor was derived from, and after which MIPS the Rabbit in Super Mario 64 is named after, but no. In this case, MIP mapping is a method of anti aliasing a pattern at long distances. The MIP is an acronym for Multum in Parvo, which translates from Latin to much in little. Anyways, the main purpose of MIP mapping is for a patterned graphic to look better in the distance, as shown in this example here. So in this tech demo, we can again zoom in and out, change the texture, scale it, and all that jazz. I thought it was pretty cool to zoom in and see the textures up close and just how different they are between the different filters. 
All right, time for our first tech demo quote unquote game called Mirror House Cornflake, apparently developed by Monegi. We get a title screen, a character select screen, even though I was only able to select the one character and the face graphic transition is pretty strange, and yeah, even a playable game part. The gameplay is almost as basic as the story. You walk around a maze of apparently mirrors to get to the end goal, all while collecting cornflakes along the way. And who are we playing as? Well, here's this game's deep lore. Get this. We play as Flake, a cheerful boy who loves cornflakes so much that he had to go venture off to find a mysterious castle filled with cornflakes. Bruh, just go hit up the grocery store or something. Anyways, yeah, there's not too much to this sample game. The maze is really basic. There are only two cornflakes things to find, and you don't even need to get them. You can press R to kind of zoom out a bit, which helps you see where to go. Or you can press B to end it all and never reach the cornflakes dream you've always wanted. Anyways, after trying to do a bit of research, it appears that Monegi was a partnership venture between Nintendo and Hudson Soft in early 1998. And this game was apparently a demo that was included as a sample with the Monegi Smart Pack software development kit. It's funny, in a weird logical leap sort of way, you can almost see this demo as a precursor to Mario Party, which was also developed by Hudson Soft later that year. Moving along, now onto Morph Demo, and this features a cube morphing into a sphere textured with the image of our old pal Mario we saw earlier. Then similarly, Morph Faces does the same thing, but in a 2D sense, and uh, I don't like it. These two fine fellas are apparently Tom Yermoyuk, SGI's president, and Edward McCracken, the company's CEO. I do have to wonder if these two SGI bigwigs knew they were being used as a 2D image morphing demo. Next is Motor Test, which is apparently supposed to demo the Rumble Pack feature. Just like the Transfer Pack, since this is emulated, there's not much I could do here but move around the control stick. Next is NN Sample 1, and this is apparently a sample program from the Nintendo 64 Technical Support Center from January 17th, 1997. Here we get to control a spaceship looking thing by rotating it around the center and moving it forward and back. And you can even shoot out little laser beams. Thumbs up for that. This demo also has a second mode, which can be toggled by pressing the start button. This mode features a pair of Nintendo 64 controller models. The one in the middle just rotated in place, but I was able to move around and scale the second one, and for some reason, pressing the A button made a sound that sounds like a sensor beep. I can press A to censor the game! That's annoying. It's pretty cool, and I feel like this controller model looks pretty familiar. I feel like it's the one that Kay's used in that one challenge video I did. Now next are several demos showcasing the NU system, which is supposedly short for Nintendo Ultra System. This was essentially an interface that could be used to communicate with the N64's operating system to aid development. Anyways, first we have NU 0 through 5. NU0 just features a gradient square, NU1 and 2 introduce the ability to move and rotate it, NU3 introduces the ability to cycle through and play several sounds from SGI data, NU4 does the same but with Nintendo 64 sound tools data instead, And finally, NU5 is a sample showing the performance of the NU system. Then, NU GFX, NU Overlay, and NU XBus are all again basic sample tests with the same square, not much to say there. NU LOD is a sample program to showcase the LOD or level of detail of a text model that somewhat ironically reads near as it floats far away. Here the animation loops, but you get to set how close you want it to start, as well as how far away you want it to end, in addition to moving it and rotating it around. And last in the NU Saga is NU Snake, and this one is the most interesting in the bunch. This is actually another game sample. This time it actually has multiplayer, as each player takes control of one of these snake things. You can move around and fire away parts of your body. The player with the most body segments wins. Pretty basic stuff. 
Unfortunately though, the game doesn't quite work in the state as intended. Shooting a segment at opponent's heads doesn't seem to stun them, and you can't steal segments from an opponent by touching them. So really, there's not too much to this game in this state. Regardless though, still a pretty cool little sample, and bonus points again for it being multiplayer. Stepping away from the NU system stuff, though not all that different from some of them, next we have One Try, which just renders a single rotating polygon, One Try F Pal, which is the same thing but a Pal region version, and finally One Try NOS Pack Test. The last one, based on the name, was also supposed to test the N64 controller pack in some way. Overlay is again the same polygon, but apparently this is a test of overlaying two different segments of data that share the same memory area, though it doesn't seem to have any visual effect for us. Moving on. Playsec is next, and it just turned out as a black screen, but it started playing a pretty slap in tune. Here's a quick sample. Again, as the name suggests, this was a sample program used to test the system's sequence player. Then, PlaySec N Audio is a modified version of PlaySec made to support N Audio. It too plays a pretty interesting audio sample. Next are three programs, all of which are pretty much the same Reboot, Top Gun, and Top Gun Reboot. Featuring a large US Air Force jet flying through the sky, this demo was apparently meant to be part of a restart sequence program that was to work in tandem with the cancelled Nintendo 64 accessory, the N64DD. The idea was that the Top Gun program was supposed to be loaded from an inserted game pack, and the One Try program from before was to be written onto the disc inserted in the 64 disk drive. One would likely close and then reboot into the next game, I guess as a test to see how information could be transferred between the two. Unfortunately, since I'm not lucky enough to have a 64DD myself, we're just stuck with the DD not connected graphic. At least it's still a pretty cool sequence though. Next up is Sample, and this features what looks like a 4x4 Rubik's Cube and a beach ball on a backdrop of a lightning storm over a city. Not much we haven't seen by now, we can move and rotate and distort the graphics, scroll the tiled backdrop image, and either rotate the right graphic or split it in two, depending on which emulator I used. The rotation one was from a newer emulator, so I'm gonna assume that's the correct one. Then we got Sound Monkey, and just as the name suggests, it's basically as if a monkey was given a keyboard with a bunch of different sound effects. Here, have a listen. Sometimes it kinda slaps though. SP Game is next, and this basically just has several bronze circles bouncing around with the illusion that they are 3D as they grow and shrink in size. There's a timer that shows how long you've been playing, and a bunch of other timers measuring things such as the realty signal and realty display processor time. Not sure why this is labeled as a game though, because I haven't found a way to interact with this demo at all, as it doesn't seem like any inputs do anything. Next is Sprite, and this loads an image from Donkey Kong Country. This image can be moved, cropped, flipped vertically and or horizontally, and of course, stretched. Then Sprite Monkey EX does basically the same thing, but here you can only flip the image horizontally, and in addition to the Donkey Kong Country image, there's an image of a shipwreck, the lightning storm we saw earlier, and also a snowy highway. There also appears to be another sort of option to swap between a low and high resolution version of the images by pressing B, but the change seems very minimal. Teapot features what else but a teapot rotating over a brick texture. You can't do anything here, but move the shadow around, as well as manipulate its size. Since the shadow is editable like this, that means it actually isn't being cast by the teapot, and is instead a separate graphic. Next up we have Terrain, which is another really cool one. Here you're given a slab of terrain, and you can deform it to your heart's content. You can also play around with the lighting, colors, as well as the method of altering the terrain. Like here I was able to raise several little mountain things at once, which honestly looked pretty unsettling. With text light, we see the return of the teapot, and this time we can actually interact with it. 
You can change the texture, its scale, zoom in and out, change the lighting, and even change it to a cube. Based on the name, this was very likely used to test lighting on the textures, and this notion is further backed up by just how extensive these light menus are here. Gotta love Brick Teapot. Next is Tile Rect 2D, and this demo scrolls through a 2D texture giving you the illusion that you're looking around in a 360 degree space. And yeah, you might recognize this cafe as the backdrop we saw in that unused test stage we had a look at back in my Super Smash Bros. Melee Lost Fits video. This image from the now-closed Cafe Verona in California is apparently a test image commonly used for testing 3D graphics. Then in a similar fashion, next is Tile Rect 3D, but this time the demo simulates a full range of viewing at any angle. Here, however, you can also switch to the snow highway scene, as well as a globe of some sort. Next is Tron, and once again, as the name implies, this very basic sample demo here is based off the light bike sequence from the original Tron movie and arcade game. You control this blue streak on a checkered floor by pressing R and L to pivot to the right and left respectively, with the main goal being avoiding the edges as well as your own tail. There's no multiplayer here or anything, so not much else to say. And finally, the last tech demo for this video is called Voice. At first, all I could read was the device error in the middle, as well as a prompt to press the A button, which seemed to do nothing. But after using the magic of Google Translate, it appears this was supposed to be a test program for voice recognition, and it just tells you that something else is connected instead. Hmm, a voice recognition device for the Nintendo 64. Where have I heard of that before? That's right, this was very likely a test program for the Nintendo 64 Voice Recognition Unit, or VRU, which only ended up being used in Hey You Pikachu, as well as one other Japanese exclusive game. Since the VRU was very underutilized, I'm sure this test program didn't see much use. And there it is guys, a collection of Nintendo 64 tech demos and I hope you enjoyed. I always love playing around with tech demos like this, as it really gives us a cool glimpse into what development and showcasing or testing console capabilities was like in the past. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop a like down below, and be sure to check out some more of my Lost Bits videos like the one I made on the GameCube by clicking on the card right here. Also subscribe here for future videos, swing by my other social media things which are all linked down below, and if you want to support the channel, check out my merch over at tetrabitgaming.com or consider becoming the latest member of the Bit Club to get some nifty extra channel perks. Click on that join button below for more information. Anyways guys, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.